Well, here we are again. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our July live chat. I uh, hope that um, everybody's all geared up now and ready to think about perspective. Uh, so while everybody's coming on, uh, I want to give just a little bit of a house, what you, they call it housekeeping. I don't know. There's no no really housekeeping involved. But anyway, um, the way it's going to work is like it always works is that uh, we begin the live chat with a short video introducing the topic. The topic this time is perspective without rules. You Did you know that you don't really need to know the rules of perspective in order to get correct, correct perspective? So I want to talk to you, show you how we can do that. And then uh, after that, the, our members can ask questions. Now, to be a member, you join the Studio Insiders. Uh, underneath all their videos and at the top there of the uh, channel page, you'll see the word join somewhere. Wherever you see that word join on our page, hit it <laughs> and you'll pay a uh, $4.99 a month to be a member. Members get these special uh, perks they call them. We think they're treats. Uh, for every month you get a free video lesson from our uh, video from our lessons website dianemize.com. You get a coupon code every month. Members do. Members do. And members also every second Sunday get a snippet. A little bit of wisdom uh, that you can apply to your drawing and painting. And then, um, let's see, every first Sunday you get the, the code, a new code for your free free video lesson. This, of course, on either third or fourth Sunday, you have we have this live chat, and uh, the members get to ask questions. And we have to do it that way because uh, if, if we have it open for everybody to ask questions, the, the whole question bin gets totally out of control. <laughs> we can't handle it. So... That's the way we do it. I also want to remind you, if you don't already know, we have something new. And that is, we now have our academy. The academy is where we are now teaching all the online courses, self-pacing. What that means is that you can sign up for a course and you can take it at your own pace. It's, uh, the courses are compiled of video lessons uh, then we have master courses, which are going really in depth on a single subject about putting your paintings together, which is called composing paintings and many courses, which are guiding you into a course form from the video lessons. Uh, so that's found at dianemizeacademy.com. Of course, we still have and always will, uh, dianemize.com, which is where you get your lessons down, downloads. So we have 170 lessons there now, and also some free stuff for you. So lots of ways to learn. That's what we're trying to do is to offer as many options to meet as many needs as possible, because we know that everybody is working on a different level. All right, so we're getting quite a, uh, getting a nice little number of folks to come in now. Um, so I think it's time we go ahead and get started and we will, as usual, uh, start out. This is about a 12, little 12 minute video clip introducing to you or showing you, uh, really a simple way that you can get perspective without rules. Uh, so members get your questions ready. If a question pops up, I prefer really that you wait until after the video to ask the question. And uh, because I don't know how you can ask a question and watch at the same time. That's just me being a, a little bit of an old fogey. But anyway, Roger, are you ready? Ready to go. Yeah. All right. So roll that video. There are more rule books written about perspective than anything else we deal with in painting, but we really don't need all those rules. Let's begin here. Visual perspective is how the human eye sees images in space. We have aerial perspective, which is the perspective that deals with things moving in space. What happens to things as they move further and further away from our eyes? 
And we have linear perspective, which deals with the angles of things. And that's the one we want to look at today. The one that has so many rules in rule books, but we don't need those rules. And the reason we don't need those rules is because we have the clock. Anybody who can read an analog clock can find any angle, anywhere, anything that you look at that has an angle, and everything has an angle, you can find it on the clock. Now let me show you how this works. Okay, here we have a fence. We can see in that fence that are a lot of different angles. An angle going this way. Uh, we see the boards down here moving in this direction. We see this is an angle. We see the different slants going in an angle. So if we wanted to do a drawing or a painting of that fence, and we didn't know how to find those angles, we would not need one point perspective, which is what would be required here. We do not need those rules to show us those angles. We can find them on the clock, and I'm going to show you how. The easiest way to show you this, first of all, is to show you how to read an angle on the clock. So we can move the clock around like this. What we have to be careful about is that we keep the 12 and 6 exactly vertical. Now, if we start turning the clock in one direction or another, we will, we'll get a false reading. So that's the one thing to remember. The 9 and 3 are absolutely horizontal. The 12 and 6 are absolutely vertical. Now, if we're trying to find an angle, let's say the angle of this board right here, we can move the clock and get it in the vicinity of that angle. And then find a place on the clock that seems to align with that angle. And you see all these lines cross over it. We would have to come about right here. And we can see now that that board is exactly aligned with 1 o'clock. So to get the angle of that board, all we need to do is to make the drawing at a 1 o'clock angle. We can see that all the parts of that particular board are at 1 o'clock. Now to get the board above it, you see that board is more aligned with 2 o'clock. And let's see, going on above the top of the fence, you see the top of the fence here is more aligned with 3 o'clock. If we're looking at the roof here, uh, we see that we don't see a place on the clock that exactly aligns with that but wait <laughs> but wait it actually sits the angle actually sits what at what we might call 1030 right here now we bring the angle of the clock over here and we find that that angle sits more on what we might call um 10.50, uh, what would you be about 10 minutes till 11, this angle right here. So you see, if you can read a clock, if you can tell what time it is by on an analog clock, and you can read those angles, if you will assign every angle you see to where it's located on the clock, you see how easy that is to find. Now let me take you on a little trip to my backyard. I want to show you how we can use an angle finder and combine the angle finder with the clock to find any angle we're looking at. I'm using here the handle of my paintbrush. You can see I'm holding it out in front of my eyes and I'm turning it slowly to align it with the various edges I see on that little shed. And I can glance at the clock to the upper left there and locate every angle I find with my angle finder. So here I have the vertical, uh, exactly vertical really, of those trees, and I see that is 12 or 6. Now let's go to the other end of the shed. I'm going to show you how where we are located will change the angles we're looking at. First let's get the angle finder aligned uh, with that front edge. As I get it adjusted here, I can see that that front edge 
is aligned pretty much with just below 9 o'clock. Now I want to turn it around and align it with that upper edge. And let's see, where is that? As I pull it down, you, this really knows, needs to go very slow so that you can get a, pretty close to the exact reading. So as I align it with that, I'm seeing that edge is sitting right on the 930. Now move your eyes across on the clock and you'll see it's also 330. So the advantage of the clock is we have both sides of these alignments that we can work with. Let's move over now to a different viewpoint and see how the angle has changed. With this more frontal view of the building, we can see now that the angle has changed considerably and now it's just shy of 1030. Let's change our point of view altogether now and move over so that we can see the side of the building. We see an even more dramatic change of that angle. Now we can see in that position, with our location being in that position, the angle is now changed to 130. Normally, if you want to do a painting or a drawing of a scene like this, you might think you would need to know one-point perspective. But what if you didn't know one-point perspective? Well, or what if you didn't feel comfortable using one-point perspective? Well, I want to show you how you can do that. You have these ang all these angles here, and you see as the height of the buildings move up from the point of view we have right here, each angle changes. And so we can find those angles with our angle finder. And let me show you how this would work. We find them with our angle finder. We locate where they are on the clock, so we'll be sure that we make them, going in, uh, make them go in the right direction. And let me show you how that works. So we have here our angle finder. We're using this red line to be our angle finder. We see we have our angle finder aligned with this line right here. And to find the where that would be on the clock, let's bring the clock up. Now what we would need to do there is move the clock around until we find where that angle finder aligns on the clock. Now to do that, we're just sure that the angle finder goes right through the center, right here. Uh, the clock, the angle finder goes right through the center of the clock, right here. And that way we can always be sure on the right angle, we're on the right angle. So we see on this side, that angle is a, you might call it 830 or halfway between 8 and 9 however it works best for you to say it. If you're looking on this side, you see it's also halfway between 2 and 3. So we can find that angle that way. Now, we can find the other angles in the same way. Here I've placed a second angle finder uh, aligned with the top of that same side of the street. And you see the two intersect. Now that is the vanishing point of one point perspective, where those two intersect. If I go on, on the other side and place another angle finder aligned with the tops of the building on the other side of the street, you see there what happens? Those intersect too. And then we go along the sidewalk of the other side. And at a fourth angle finder, the bottom of the sidewalk there, then we can see those intersect. And that is the principle of one point perspective. Now we can find those angles on the clock the same way as we found the first angle. We'll just do one of them to show you how that works. And we see that here, the top angle of this side of the building is aligned right here at what we might call about 1245 or whatever. We can gain a sense as to where these are located, and it really is about a third of the way, uh, two-thirds this direction, one-third this direction of the clock. Yes, it does require that we uh, recognize the direction and are able to draw the direction of the clock angles. So there is some skill involved, but there's nothing to memorize. You can do a little exercise where you 
have a clock formation like this, or you can look at in a, any analog clock. And on a drawing pad with pencil, you can look just at the clock, and then you can start allowing lines to move to 12, to 1, to 2, to 3, to 4, to 5. That will give you a sense of what angle you need to move in, need your hand to move in, in order to create an angle that would go in, into one of these directions of the clock. So if you develop that skill, and if you develop the skill of using the angle finder, I think you can see how you can draw anything with angles without having to have the rules of perspective. So we'll stop right here now and let you ask your questions. Okay, now, uh, and I hope that you have some questions that you can ask. I do want to say a couple of things before or while you're preparing your questions. First of all, say hello to all those who've checked in. Um, so far, there's Mike, Carolyn, Virginia, Terry, Jen, Cheryl, Alka, all of you. Hello to you and everybody else, too, who's checked in. Um, there are two things. One thing is I, I didn't mention, and I usually do, that in order to really be able to see clearly uh, when you're holding the angle finder in front of you and you're finding angles, close one eye. Because if you don't, if it, it can get confusing. You can't see the angle finder as clearly uh, when you have both eyes open. So if you close one eye, it works better for you. And then there's another thing about when you're using the angle finder for finding things uh, out in the world. Now it's really, really easy if you're using the angle finder on a picture. I uh, see I have a something like this. See, you if you use the angle finder on a picture like that, a uh, photograph, it it's really easy. Or if you have it in front of your your monitor, it's really easy. But when you're out in the world, there's a little little uh, trap you may fall into. And that is the tendency, I've noticed uh, when people are first learning to use the angle finder, the tendency is when, when something is uh, turning away from you and you're trying to find the what would be the two-dimensional angle that you're seeing that at, the tendency is to want to turn your angle finder towards it like that. And we have to be careful because that won't that'll give you a false reading. The, uh, it doesn't change uh, the position you have it in if you turn it that way. So you always think of it as working like a windshield wiper. Now, windshield wipers on the on cars today are very slanted, but they are they're still they're going back and forth like that. And and so if you start. Uh, if you're looking at your angle finder and you're trying to find the angle of something you're looking at out in the world in plain air, or if you have a still life, whatever, uh, if you find yourself till, if you find your wrist turning, your wrist should stay locked. So if you find your wrist turning, watch out, pull it back, and and be sure that when you're finding those the angle that you're turning it on the same plane uh, like that like a windshield wiper would be, so that your wrist is not bending. Wrist uh, right here should not bend. If you see your wrist bending, then you're going to get the wrong angle. So there, there, as I said in the video, there are skills, but nothing to memorize, no rules to memorize, just skills. It's discovery. It's one of those dis things I love about some of the tools we have for painting and for drawing is there are ways to discover things that leaves a world wide open. And so when you can use discovery techniques without having to memorize anything, um, then there are all kinds of things to be discovered. Okay, now let's see, the question come in, how do you translate the angle in actual painting? It's easy. <laughs> oh, Diane, careful how you say that. <laughs> say if the angle is, is two o'clock, the angle you find is two o'clock, that means that you make a, a line or what, whatever shape you make on your on your painting or your drawing will go towards two o'clock. Let me show you how that works. I'll just show you on this little this little pad right here. 
Uh, so, so if say if I'm uh, I'm doing a drawing, and the same thing is about in painting, uh, it's the direction. It's the direction you move in. You you allow your pen to move in that direction. The angles on the clock are directions. So if you read, if you're if you're looking at an angle, say of a limb coming off a tree, and it goes at two o'clock, go towards goes towards clue at two o'clock. Say. There's the tree trunk right there. Can you see that? I don't know if you can or not. Well, then, you know, 3 o'clock goes this way, 12 o'clock goes that way, 1 o'clock goes this way, and 2 o'clock goes that way. So you'll know it goes towards 2 o'clock. And that's how you uh, can translate the angle into uh, the angle that you read. So if it's between 2 and 3, you remember. And so it, it requires... That's the reason I say it's a really good idea to do those, do an exercise where you train yourself to know uh, in which direction you would need to move your pen or your brush for every angle on the clock. So if, if you get in the habit, you can just do it in the air like this. If you get in the habit, uh, or you can build a sense of direction by uh, holding anything in your hand or just with your finger, and say 12 o'clock, this is in the air, this is what I call phantom drawing, one of my very favorite ways to draw. Phantom drawing, this is 12 o'clock, and so this is the beginning, this is the end of the angle, back and forth to 12, this is three, back and forth to three. Now, this is one, and this is two. So you build that sense of knowing which, uh, how to label those angles that you see, and when you build that sensibility, it's easy to make that reference. Or you, so that that's that's how we translate it. Same thing is true when you're using the angle finder. You when you're using the angle finder out in plain air, or you're using the angle finder for the for uh, still life, or whatever you're using it for, where, whatever angle this is is turning towards is the direction you make that mark move. Uh, it's the edge of a shape. It's usually going to be the edge of the shape. So that's direct, the direction that edge of the shape needs to take when you put it down on your pad. Whether it's a curvilinear direction or, you know, it, shapes can have variations in their edges and still the m major thrust of the shape is going in the same direction. So I hope I made that a little bit clear for you. Um, Cheryl. If you change the line of, if you change your line of sight up or down, will that change the line of perspective, or will the angle stay the same? Um, generally speaking, the angle's going. If you're if you're going down or up, generally speaking, um, the angle stays the same within a certain range. But wh what changes most is the distance between the. The front, uh, the the beginning and the end of the angle. I, I wish I'd shown you that. And when I did the little thing with uh, the shed, uh, as you're going, when you, if you get up very very high, your angle is going to change a bit. Uh, so, so both the angle and the ch size can begin to change depending on how far you are away from that building, uh, or what whatever the angle is. But the, yes. Your, your location up or down is going to uh, going to change your perspective but what changes the angles most is your location to one side or to the other and that's what I was showing you there uh, the same angle well actually it's our eyes is see the, our eyes are seeing those angles the way they are they don't really change unless, you know, unless it's an earthquake or something. <laughs> they don't really change when things are stable out in nature. Uh, but our point of view changes, and it's our point of view that creates our perspective. So that angle can, can change depending on where you are. Another thing to watch for, uh, don't, uh, um, uh, I don't hate saying it that way, in, in a building, well, especially the rooftop of a building, the angle... Uh, on that roof is going to be different uh, depending on your location but the angle won't be necessarily the same on both sides of the roof of the building so we need to pay attention to that a lot of times people think that uh, our um, 
think that a lot of times people will make one angle match the other, and our eyes don't really see it that way. If if we the further we are uh, towards the corner of a building, uh, the more the angles are going to change. So uh, maybe I hope I made that clear. Uh, now let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> Um, Debbie, I find using transparency and then laying on my sketch or canvas works well. Yes, it does. Yeah, and let me talk about the transparency just a little bit. You can, uh, I've got the clock diagram on, on the lessons website, diamonds.com, free. Uh, go, go to diamonds.com, click on the, uh, in the menu, click on free stuff. So this is free. It's a PDF. <clears throat> Pardon me. Got those frogs again. Um. Uh, and you can, if you have an inkjet printer, uh, you can get transparency, like transparencies like this that uh, are made especially for inkjet printers, and you can create the transparency. And yes, it does, it does help. It's, all, it's a wonderful check or double check if you, uh, you make the line first on your, on your pad or on your canvas, and then check it through the transparency. That does help. All kinds of things like that, but you're going to find out also that the more you do this, the more you um, use this method of finding perspective or linear perspective uh, through both the angle finder and, and the clock, uh, the less you're going to need the clock because you begin to develop a sensibility of, uh, of uh, exactly what direction something is moving in and you, the ability, because you've had the experience of it so many times, the ability of making that direction on your painting and and on your drawing. So, yeah, good good uh, good such a good a uh, good point there, Debbie. Cheryl, um, also in plain air, do you need to be sure to look straight on to whatever you're looking at at perspective for each measurement? Straight on to what you're looking. at. You don't want to change your possession. I, I guess that's what you're talking about. Uh, and and this. Um, Say when when you're doing plein air painting, wherever your easel are is, <laughs> wherever you are, um, it's a good idea to sort of plant yourself in that general position. If you move your if you move your viewpoint to the right or to the left, the angles are going to be different, and so you'll have angles from some of the angles uh, from one side of yourself and from the angles from the other side of yourself. Uh, so it's going to begin to be a bit more of a, like a cubist painting than a realistic painting. So it's a good idea to stay, in, stay keep yourself in the general position of, uh, of where you start a painting, especially if you've got lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, converging angles in it. Especially if you're like if you're looking down a river or, or a road or if uh, well. Some cases you can get away with getting angles, not exact like if you're working on branches of trees and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, when you're working on things that require perspective, like the one point perspective, be sure to keep yourself pretty much in that same position. Uh, and you don't have to be real careful. I mean, you can go a little bit this way and a little bit that way. But what I like to do when I'm painting in plain air. Um, I like to position my, well it depends on the size of the piece I'm working on, but if it's a smaller piece like this, I like to position it so I can look above it, slightly above it, and I've got that, that viewpoint. Either that or position, if it's a larger piece, I very rarely will work a very large piece in plain air. But if there's a larger piece, I can stand to one side, sort of one side, so that I can see what I'm painting here and have that exactly aligned with the canvas here. I don't think it's a good idea to have the canvas over here and your scene over there. I've seen people do that, but uh, you don't really get that parallel uh, view. You don't really get that comparison view when you do that. That's called sight, um, oh dear, <laughs> sight sizing. Sight sizing, it comes from a sight sizing that's very, old classical method of drawing where the subject and your your either your drawing pad whatever your surface working surface is 
whether it's a, a drawing pad or a canvas, when your working surface is sitting right bes right beside what you're looking at. So I'm looking right through there, got my canvas right here. So what I'm seeing there, I can compare to what I have here. Or the same thing is true this way. I, I like I like this better when I can so that my painting is right here and my eyes are looking just above the painting into whatever the subject is. It doesn't matter either way or on, the, on this side if you're left-handed um, either way. But the important thing is that you have them so that they're side by side and you can make that comparison. So I think I've seen people do this, I said before, where they'll have the canvas here and have the subject over here. And that, I don't think that cuts it because you don't have you don't have a parallel comparison so you got to really really be accurate if you if you're doing that sort of thing anyway i guess that kind of trailed off a little bit but maybe not quite much <laughs> okay um alka uh how would you translate the picture behind you <laughs> using the clock uh there seems to be too many angles yes there are many many angles in that picture behind me but you you could try to translate it, translate it very easily. Uh, you just here's my here's my clock right here, and if I hold the clock up like this, you can see now if you uh, if you switch, I can move the clock around. I can choose any set any set of windows or whatever those angles are. Uh, I could choose any set, and then as I I, I look at the clock and then I come to uh, I find an angle on the clock. I move it up and down like this, and I find an angle on the clock uh, that aligns with the angle I'm looking at, and then I am able to find what that angle is. So yes, you move the clock like this. If you're holding the transparency of the clock in front of you, and you're looking at something that complex where there are lots of windows and stuff. You hold it exactly in front, uh, parallel to your face, just like this, just like I'm doing right here. Don't turn it this way and that way, because then you get a distortion. You hold it exactly parallel in front of your face like this, and then you move it. You move the clock around, like you saw me do in the very first part of the video, where I showed you the very first scene of that video. I showed you how you move the clock around to find the vicinity of the angle and see where the angle's going. The beginning of an angle, if you align the beginning of an angle right at the center of the clock, then you can tell, is it going this way, or this way, or this way, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Well, I hope I made that clear. <clears throat> um, so, and the same thing is true. It, it's really easy with the uh, uh, angle finder like this. The same thing is true with the angle finder. If you can see how that aligns with uh, how, how that aligns with the image I have behind me. I've got about a two second delay in what I'm seeing and what you're seeing, so it's a little bit hard for me to show you how that works. But you see, if I just hold my, my angle finder like this, you can see, you can see how it aligns. Uh, let's push it up. Let's pull it up just a little bit and see if I can get it to align with that two second delay. You see, you see, you see there, uh, as I move it up, you can see how it aligns with that particular... Th okay, Roger's got this so that I can do that a little bit better. All right, here we go. Um, here we go. So now I tilt it. I tilt it, and I go back up, and I raise my arm up and down. So I raise my arm up. Now you see I have it aligned and raise my, uh, with, that, with that bottom... Where is it? Right there. That, that shape right there. That shape. To see... Now, as I go up, I can go up. Got to be careful I hold it straight. As I go up, now you see the angle changes, so I'll need to change the turn. I turn it slightly and make it align. And then as it goes up, turn it a little bit more to make it align. Make it align like that. See, as I come down, uh, there is a horizontal right there. We don't have any horizontal angles down the sides of those walls. But then if I come down... And I raise my arm, so you have to move your arm up and down and tilt as you're aligning for angles. And you see, there we go, there's that angle. That's leaning a little bit, uh, a little bit above four o'clock. Now, 
if we let me just give our Rogers got that up for me so I've got the time there um, we can see if I'm doing the clock that way all right now uh, let's see let, let me work with where is it this one right here come on there we go right in there see I'm having to look backwards but see if that angle right there I've got the clock aligned now you see if I pull the clock so the corner of the clock is touching one corner of the angle of that shape, that shape on the very bottom there, the one that has the, uh, the white um, frame around it. Uh, let's pull that close here, pull it close, and now pull it up. And now you can see that it is tilted just a little bit below 3 o'clock. And now if I go down, the next angle down is tilted a little bit more before uh, oh, towards 3 no, actually, towards that, uh, I got it backwards. <clears throat> three is the same as six. I mean, three is the th same as nine. Eight is the same as two. Four is the same as ten. So, so you have to watch that, too. Let's pull those numbers over so you can see them. Get my hand out of the way. There we go. There we go. Now, now we're probably cooking with propane. You see that bottom frame on... On the right hand side of the screen there, that bottom frame is uh, almost towards, almost tilting towards, what is that, four o'clock. You see that? So you see how you can move, you move it up and down like this, never this way, never that way, but up and down like that and back and forth like that in order to find your angle and find the tilt of the angle. So that may, maybe that made it a little bit clearer for you. Um, okay, let's see. Ooh, got lots of questions pop up while I was busy doing that. Where's the next one down there? Uh, how is perspective affected using the clock and angle finder when translating subject to a larger or smaller canvas? Um, Virginia asked that. Virginia, it doesn't. Perspe the perspective won't be affected at all. You'll just be enlarging the length of those lines. So the... Um, uh, so it, it, the si size of things, the size of the images themselves, uh, won't change a perspective. It, the, if you're just if you're just enlarging uh, a smaller image into a larger image, it won't it won't uh, the perspective won't change. It's just that the lines will be longer. Uh, so I hope that helped. Okay, let's see. Did I leave a? Uh, I'll go back. I missed uh, De I missed. Um, Cheryl's above there. Thank you, Dan. I was pondering on your comment about Cheryl's right above uh, Alka there. Uh huh. Yeah. Cheryl says um, I'm pondering on your comment about how each side of a roof may be at a different angle depending on your perspective. I haven't experienced that and didn't see. Give it a try. <laughs> Give it a try. The best way to see that is uh, put put yourself in the position so that. Uh, you are at you're standing closer to the corner where the front and side meet of a building and you can see the roof you can see the slant of the roof and uh and then check the angles and you'll see what i'm talking about there uh you you can and also if you're standing directly in front of the building uh, 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 the angles of if a slanted roof the angles of directly in front of the building will tend to towards uh of the roof will tend to kind of go towards each other like that from front to back so check that out and see what you think cheryl um let's see did i did i catch did i catch all of them now uh how would perspective on the clock affect the angle mm -hmm. yeah uh, going back to virginia's question uh the uh well, I don't know they even make any difference whether your clock is a larger clock or a smaller clock, but still, because the clock, the angles of the, the hands on the clock are pretty much the same, regardless of uh, how large or small. If you look at your angles, if, you, if you're if you using an analog watch, I know we have to speak in terms of analogs these days, but if you look at the analog watch and then compare the angle of, of where 2 o'clock is on the analog watch, and then look at Big Ben, which is probably about one of the biggest watches in the world, and compare the angle is going to be the same, pretty much the same. 
So the angle of 3 is always horizontal. The angle of 9 is always horizontal. The angle of 12 is always vertical. The angle of 6 is always vertical. And then you, one way to... Um, uh, one to, way to build a sensibility about those directions, and it is direction. It's which way is my mark going to move to show that? That's what it is. Which way is my shape going to move? Which way is the edge of my shape going to move to show that angle? That's what you'll be doing. Um, so you develop a sensibility about where one and two are located in related to, in relationship to one and three. It's the same thing. They're diagonals. Uh, vertical, the, the 12 and 6 is not a diagonal, it's a vertical. The, th the uh, 3 and 9 are horizontal, they are not diagonals. Everything else is a diagonal. And we, we had a chat about di diagonals some time back, I think. Or I know the, the diagonal movement has come into our chats before. So um, you, one thing that a painter can do is to develop a sensitivity, uh, develop a, yeah, a sensitivity, sensibility, a sensibility to those things, uh, just like uh, you develop a sensibility of directions when you're driving, uh, but you develop a sensibility of what direction a line moves in. Nobody's asked me a question about wh what about circles yet. I was expecting that one to come up. Um, shall I answer it before you ask? Probably so. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see, Virginia. Um, I need to practice enlarging and reducing canvas size. Yes, Virginia, practice always works. You see the thing. I, I pointed that out in. Uh, I pointed that out in my weekend, in my little Saturday message to those who are subscribed to our mailing list. Uh, the, the the that when you repeat an activity the neurons in your brain connect and the more you repeat that activity the stronger that connection and you build that's how you build skills so it's not just a matter of practicing because you ought to we practice in order to build the neurons the connection of the neurons in our brains that connect the muscular activity with the with the visual activity and it then it becomes second nature and so, uh, yes, practicing is, our, our, you know, doing it. Doing it is the best way to learn it. Deb, um, in one of your quick tips, you used a pen and a string to assist you in placing angles. Yes. When you discover that what you're viewing is in one point perspective. Could you expand on this? Yes. Yes, I can expand on that. Um, I use all kinds of tricks to teach one point perspective, but um, the one point perspective is simply starts with, as uh, all all perspective starts with your viewpoint. Where are you? Where are you, the viewer? And wherever you are are located, and, and the level for one point perspective, the level for finding the horizon line is always vertical. How far up are you or how far down are your eyes? That's where your eyes are located. Now notice that when your eyes, when you look down, your eyes don't change position in your head. I mean, they, they may move back and forth and up and down, but they don't move. They don't poke out. Never mind. <laughs> but, but the point is that where the level at which you're located is the horizon line. It's what you see what we call the horizon line. It's not the line that where the earth, yeah, where the earth meets the sky is uh, astrologically or, geolo or whatever, geologically or whatever the logical it is. That's the horizon line out there. But the visual horizon line is your eye level. Now, on that eye level is where lines converge in one point perspective, in two point perspective, one point and two point perspective. That, uh, the eye level is where the lines converge. And so what I was doing with that string, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how I did it now because I do it different ways, but I find that one point, one point perspective means that all the line, horizontal lines that are turning in that direction are going to turn towards that point. They're going to connect there, vanish there. 
like I showed you in the building, the uh, I think it was the la very last little frame I showed you in the video. So you could imagine my paintbrush here as the string. And so the string then would align with what I see. If I'm holding this as a string over here, it would align with what I'm seeing, uh, how I'm seeing the the um, horizontal lines on that building, um, uh, the angles at which they are turned. And that way I can always be sure that I have them aligned in the perspective that I see them in when I'm looking at that building. So the, the string serves the same purpose as the angle finder does. It's just a way to anchor something to a point and turn it this way and find the alignment of horizontal lines that you're looking at in order to get something, uh, uh, in order to get in perspective what you're looking at. So one point perspective is when you're looking down at something, you have sides, uh, you have something on both sides of you, like a built, like buildings, like a river, you're standing in the middle of a river, you're standing in the middle of a railroad track, standing in the middle of a road, where you've got more or less parallel lines moving away from you into the distance like that, there, those lines are going to converge visually. If you keep that line moving, those lines moving, they will visually converge in the distance. And that convergence is called the point, and that convergence will always happen on your eye level, right here, wherever you are. So if, you, if you're low down, you're sitting on the ground or lying on the ground, it's going to be different from it is if you're standing up on a ladder or up in the top of the tree. Okay, how did that work out? I hope okay. Um, let's see, I got kind of behind on answering the questions there. Uh, uh, oh, Diane, what about circles? <laughs> yeah, I was about to say about circles, wasn't it? All right, I'll show you about circles. I said early that one of the very first statements I made in the video was everything, everything has angles. And when we're looking at circles, the problem with circles, we don't usually have a problem making a circle like that. But if we have, if it, we turn it, have it turn in a direction, one direction or the other, then that can sometimes get to be a problem. And so what you do is, if you will notice what I'm doing here, as I turn this angle, if I turn this angle, or right, I need to move this, I need to move this. Okay, you can see, Let's do it on this side right here. You can see, you can see on the side there, now my brush, the edge of the corner of my brush is beginning to align right back here. Can you see that? See how it begins to align with that edge right back there? Like that. Now, if I turn it very slightly, then you can see it's beginning to align with this portion right here. You see that? Let me just see if I can get, get a demonstration going for you here. And turn and if I can just keep it still. So I get that now. If I turn it very slightly, hold over here, turn it very slightly. Now you see it begins to add. And what we have going around a circle is numerous planes changing direction. Numerous planes changing direction. And the corners are rounded out. So if we can kind of average out the direction that those planes are turning in. So this plane is, is uh, this, this is the 12 o'clock plane right here. And then if I turn that very gradually, I'm seeing that ends up being about a one o'clock plane, the way that's turned there and so on. And then it, the plane will get sharper as it gets. And then when it gets to the top here, you see we're going to have, uh, let's get that line. Um, again, one front, there we go. So now you see at the top, we have a very short, Horizontal plane. There's a very short six o'clock, uh, three, three, nine, six o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock plane. Horizontal there. So we've got a vertical plane on either side here. Horizontal plane either side there. And then the planes turn, and they turn very great. They turn, um, they turn in increments, you might say, and the corners are rounded off. Now the other thing about this is foreshortening. This has to do with foreshortening. Uh, how when something that's curved, other, other, this is not the only thing with your shortening, but uh, the other thing that happens is that as you turn something around, 
away from you, it gets shorter from one side to the other. So it gets shorter from this side to this side to this side. You see they're much shorter there. If I hold my angle finder sort of like there you can see. There you see how much shorter that is than that is long there. I don't know, maybe I did that kind of awkwardly. But if you think of circles, when you think of circles, uh or try to analyze uh circles as a sequence of planes turning away from each other and the corner is rounded off, then uh, then it enables you to find you you can use then the clock and the angle finder to find um find find different shapes of uh, ellipses that are after circles turn they change to um is it ellipse is that what i call if i call it the right thing i hope yeah i know i'm supposed to let, know all the language i do most of the time <laughs> or cheryl uh i find i get into trouble if i don't use the clock it helped me determine this Sides of images like people as they move into distance. Oh, you mean where they're located? How, how, how yeah, you locate them? Hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, the, the thing about these tools that uh, we have available to us is that we start can start using them for one specific uh, purpose, and then we realize while we're in the process of using them, sometimes we can uh, expand their use to other purposes too. It's a matter of what anything we can do to help us see what our eyes are looking at, help us to see uh, what 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 are the visual things that make up the world. That's what the painter is always concerned about as uh, number one. If we if we study how the uh, how the world is made up, what what are the visual elements you see? What are the visual elements doing in the images you see? Uh, what directions are the, in what directions are the lines moving? And in what directions? Uh, what are the sizes? Comparison of sizes between one image and the other? Uh, uh, how are the sizes overlapping? Uh, how is the color? All those things that we study is teaching us how to see visually. And the more we can, uh, the better we can see the world visually, the more we can discover about what the visual world is made of out there. And I think that's one of the, I think that's one thing that's so exciting about the whole process of, of painting is that you have, you, you're discovering in at least two different ways. You're discovering the world out there and how it's made up and how it's different and how it's similar and all those things, and then you're putting those things into your painting, and then you begin to discover how those things are relate, what the relationship of those things are as you're working with them on, on your canvases and on your, uh, your papers, depending on what painting medium you're using. Yes, all of these composing uh, things we talk about are the same in all painting media. People often, uh, I get this a lot. Where well, can you do that in acrylic? I mean, can you can you compose in acrylic? Can you compose in watercolor? Uh, yes. Can you compose in gouache? You compose in everything you use as a painting medium or a drawing medium. Uh, so the medium is not the medium does not change the way the world is made up. Uh, the medium is just re requires each medium requires a different technique for making these these translations of that world happen. That got off the subject a little bit there. Okay, let's see. Alka says, a new perspective in, to circles. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, good, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, every circle's made up of planes. All right, so now, uh, is, is that gonna be it on the questions? I, I have you worn yourselves out in thinking about uh, perspective without rules? Now you can see what I mean. You know, I think one of the things that one of the traps that painters can often fall into, young emerging painters especially, one of the traps we can fall into is everything has to go by the rules. Well, first of all, uh, there are many, many 
rules out there. They should have no business being there. They shouldn't be there as rules at all. But what we should be doing as teachers of painting, what we should be doing, my my conviction is that what we should be doing is teaching you how to see and how to discover two things: what the world, how the world is made up visually, what the the visual characteristics of the world, how to see those visual characters, now to see, not rules about what's there, and then how to uh, the, how to make those things work in a painting uh, by what principles do to each other, you know? Principles are not rules. Principles are functional, alive um, ways of making paintings belong, making images and paintings belong together and making paintings appealing to other people, or making paintings communicate their message, all the purposes that paintings serve. It's the principles that guide that. And so if I could just get, if I could just get that one message across to the world, the entire world of painting, if you're making rules in your teaching, see if you can find a way to show how to discover those things rather than to make rules about it. Because Lord knows we've got enough to remember We're trying to memorize rules. We don't need to do that. But when we can actually experience how something comes together, we can ex actually experience how our principle works. There's the neuron connection again. It causes the neurons in the brain to connect those things and make them belong to us so then we can expand on that. We can discover more and more and more about it. Okay, let's see here. Virginia. Um, my first teacher did a great disservice in teaches from tracing. Oh, Lord, no. Tracing, it has been challenging to restart, but I'm getting there. Good for you, Virginia. I, I got to tell you, folks, that's one thing that gets my ire up more than anything else, is when uh, someone teaches you to trace. A lot of times I hear of, uh, of, uh, of, of um, how can I say this? I hear of things, of uh, images, I mean, um, drawings being passed out for you to trace onto your canvas and then you copy. Uh, that is not teaching you how to make decisions. That's not teaching you how to make discoveries. That's teaching you how to copy what somebody else has done. That one I can get on a real rant about in a hurry. Uh, and can say some pretty nasty things about it, so I won't do that. But I'll just say, tracing is not the way to go if you want to expand and grow as an artist. If all you want to do is reproduce what somebody else has done, fine, but I'm not your teacher. But if you want to grow as an artist, tracing is not the way to go. Now, there is a difference between tracing somebody else's images, tracing a photograph, to plot it on your canvas. It, and what we might call, uh, uh, it wouldn't be really tracing, is transferring a drawing you've done to the canvas. That's not what I'm talking about. If you've done a, if you've done a small drawing, a small composition, and now you say that really works as a composition, I'd like to use that on a larger piece. Uh, the artists have been doing that for centuries. Michelangelo did that. That's how he did the Sistine Chapel. Uh, artists have done the century. So you make your plan and then you enlarge your plan in on a little larger piece. I'm not talking about that. Not at all. That's transferring. I'm talking about the business of making traces directly from somebody else's work or traces from uh, photographs onto using those overhead projectors. I mean, those uh, tracing projectors and things like that. Like I said before, if that's your preference, I'm not your teacher, because that is not discovering, that's not learning how to be a painter, that's learning to trace and to copy. All right, so I will get off of that rant, but anytime that's brought up, I'm sorry. It's just like I used to get on rants about coloring books, and I won't get on that anymore, but I discovered back in my early, early days of teaching, I discovered the harm that coloring books can do to a kid's creativity. And uh, and I began to get on this real, I began to get on this real uh, mission about uh, 
uh, not 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 giving kids mimeograph things to color in. Uh, but I wouldn't even go there today because you know we have veered way off from the perspective of that rules. But nevertheless, that's what you get into when you get in a conversation with me. I do get on my rants. All right, let's see. Alka, you make serious le learning fun with your sense of humor and not to forget your depth of knowledge and insight. Life itself. Thanks, Alka. Well, I tell you, yeah, uh, it is a fun activity. And I've always... Uh, I always like to take serious things and make up, but never mind about that. Okay, hey, I'm looking at my watch, and here it is already 3 o'clock, so we, we're going to have to sign off and get out of here. But thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we, you've, you've asked some wonderful questions, and it's been um, a delightful little time with you. So we will plan to see you again in August for another live chat. Meanwhile, go out and discover how to use... Uh, how to dis discover perspective without rules, uh, learning how to use your angle finder and learning how to associate that with the directions of movement you find on the clock. So that's it for now. Thanks to all of you. Have yourselves a, a wonderful rest of uh, the day, if you have any day left wherever you are. And so bye-bye for now.